Hi guys, welcome to another edition of Nicola Studies Chess with one and only Miss Messi, International Master Elizabeth Becht. Good Hello. morning, Elizabeth. Good morning. So I actually don't know what uh, Eliz Elizabeth has prepared for us. We are both looking here at the analysis board and this looks like one of those interesting positions that we're supposed to analyze. This is one of the positions where you are supposed to basically warm up. It's a kind of calculation exercise where it's very important to understand or to evaluate eventually the position, but also to calculate precisely. Okay. All right. So Anyway, just a very quick answer to Graham Steiner, one, two, three. Welcome to the stream. And uh, my favorite opening is I like to play martial attack against E against E4 as black. I also like Adam's attack and I also like uh, uh, to play Kings Indian against D4. I hope that that answers your question. It's very good to see you. Anyway, hey, Bunkenader, and hey, Far Eastern, it's very good. It's very good to see you guys. All right, so this is a warm up. Okay, so we're analyzing the position. The material appears to be equal. White has a bishop pair, and this pawn on d6 is a little bit further advanced. Uh, we do not seem to have any. Don't don't seem to have any checks. We have a capture on d4. And I will venture to say that apparently the evaluation of this position depends on whether capturing on d4 is a, is a valid option or not. Absolutely correct. Okay. Hey, PUBG1, thank you for the raid uh, with a party of 34. That's very greatly appreciated. Thank you for the raid, my friend. Uh, let's give PUBG21, uh, G, uh, G21 uh, a raid. Uh, just a very quick uh, shout out. Uh, okay. Please give PUBG to G91 a follow. And he is playing chess. And a big shout out to Nandi Chess, who is here. She is a fellow streamer and a friend. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And the Raiders, this is. Nicola studies chess with international master Elizabeth Specht. It's a new series on my channel. It's every Wednesday at, at 7 a.m. East, Eastern time, 1 p.m. Central European time. And uh, it's dedicated to improving, improving chess. Hey, Angelica Chessboard. It's very good to see you too. Uh, let's see. Uh, give Angelica a shout out. And hey, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pat. Uh, G91, thank you for the raid. Very greatly appreciated. Thanks. All right. Going back to the position. Can we capture on d4? If we capture on d4, we need to evaluate this knight, knight f3 um, check, which is, which is a tactic. And we can take and... Uh, we can take with a bishop and then black can take the queen, but then we end up with the two bishops for a rook, unless I'm mistaken. Another option is we, uh, instead of, uh, we can, it's black instead of capturing on d4, can capture on f3, and then we have a discovered threat on the queen. Okay. Yes. Very good. And the question here is, what is the proper answer to that? What's the, the basically we're evaluating a position with a knight with a queen on f3, uh, black queen on f3, white queen on d4, and knight, uh, black knight, and white light square bishop being gone. Okay. Yes, that's two basically positions you have to evaluate. Even so, one probably is easy to evaluate because if I don't take the exchange by queen takes d4, but capture on f3, then you are at least a pawn up. Plus, you have still your trump card on d6. Correct. So, so, so the that's best... not a critical line. 
That's the critical line, right? That, that's not that critical line. The critical line is basically when you sacrifice the exchange and you should evaluate whether okay. this is beneficial for you or not. All right. So take on a, so basically queen d4, and I'm going to draw the arrows. Uh, queen d4, knight f3, uh, knight f3, we take with, on f3. Uh, black takes on d4, we take, we take on d4. And uh, we take, take, and basically we end up with, uh, we're an exchange down. So after bishop takes d4, when black takes c rook on d4, the exchange, you should still go on with your calculation and look for more moves, like to follow up. All right, so the question here is, what is the best move in this position, that position? Okay, there are no checks in that position. Uh, mm -hmm. There, are, I don't see a capture in that position outside of capture on B7, that's probably not, doesn't look like it's beneficial. Actually, the, the, the bishop is not there, so actually is the bishop there? Yes, the bishop is there, so. That's not beneficial. Okay, so... What yeah. candidate moves do you have after bishop takes d4? You don't have captures, this is correct. You don't have checks, that is correct too. Yeah. But the next moves to be considered in the list are what kind of moves usually? Threats, which... Absolutely correct, and yeah. I have a threat to play rook d1 and bishop needs to withdraw and then I'm pushing d7 and then... Uh, so after the threat, uh, black can play bishop f6. Well, why I should play bishop f6? I mean, probably also bishop b6. Both moves are possible. You should also try to understand is the bishop on d4 for you actually disturbing or is the bishop besides perhaps yeah. better on b6 or f6 where it also guards the square on d8 so this rook d1 move is only one candidate but not the only one in this position okay understood all right um all right so we probably in this position we want to push the pawn Yes, this is of course a candidate which you should uh, evaluate because the thing is like, as I said, the bishop on d4 is not disturbing you at all. On b6 or on f6, it gives a lot more stability towards the square d8. Okay, um, yes, um, all right. Hey, Derek, it's very good to see you. I mean, the let me put it this way, white, is definitely as a compensation would exchange the question here is is there a very quick way to convert this and we can play rook c7 for example putting the rook on the on the but that's that's replied by bishop to e5 probably yes and then if you capture on b7 you will lose your trump card on d7, d7 in yes. exchange so after d7, you know that rook d8 is the only move to be applied. Otherwise, rook yeah. c8 would follow up. So after rook d8, once again, you said rook c7 is one candidate. What other candidate moves do you have after rook d8? Okay, so after d7 and rook d8, uh, mm -hmm. I still have the bishop on f3. Uh, the pawn on d7 is undefended, so I need to defend it somehow. Uh, if I defend... I yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I mean, like you, of course, you can like defend it with rook c7, but you already realize that after no. bishop e5, you will lose the trump card. But before you look in general about a defense, always look for a counter attack because the best defense is the active defense. So Agreed. you should always automatically watch out for any active moves you have. And here the question is after d7, rook d8, what active move is still in the position? Okay. Um, there is an active move, uh, there is a bishop d6, which attacks the highest value piece. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, it attacks the rook on b8 and it prevents rook takes d7. Absolutely correct. Yeah, and the question here is that rook, since since rook is already on d8, can only go to a8, and then we can take the pawn on b7, and that rook has nowhere to go. That's one option. What is a stronger option even than to take on b7? Because if I take on b7, I will take on d7, you take on a8, I take on d6. I'm not an exchange up anymore, but I have very good drawing chances. So after rook okay. a8, what other candidate move do you have now? Okay. So we are looking at the variation that basically uh, starts with d7, bishop d6, okay? And uh, what else can I do here? After rook a8, rook yes. a8. Um, well, I can now play rook c7 because now the bishop e5, after bishop e5, I can take the pawn on b7. You can take you can capture the, the the bishop on e5 because your bishop is on d6. But even after bishop b6 with the same idea, you have rook takes b7. You keep your trump card and actually yeah. this position for white is totally winning. Yeah. So, so in yeah, so that's in general, the line. Yes, this is the line. In general, like this is not a kind of difficult exercise, but you should always force yourself before you look for defending moves to look for the active ones. Okay. So queen takes f3 is nothing because you can simply capture on a7 and after bishop b2 you have moves like d7 yeah. followed up by some kind of tricks connected to queen takes b8, rook takes b8. And actually, Nicola, how do you win here in this position? Um, good question. Um, I can just play uh, rook c8 check. Yes, rook c8 check is seemingly the move here to be winning because after king g7 what move do you have because this one has to be calculated yes i have rook f uh, sorry bishop f8 check yes and bishop f8 then is i promote winning. with check or i'm mating absolutely I'm correct mating yes. so for this reason actually this queen takes um f3 doesn't make sense because you just end up in a much better um version in the game as a pawn app so that's why um, this is the only capture. And here there was a discussion between rook d1 and d7, but you also saw that the rook on c7 at some point might be very useful. Yeah. So that was the key move in this position, actually in the whole calculation is bishop d6, because that gives your rook some space on b7. Yeah, so because, because I don't need to move the rook away when... Uh... When yes. Then if he plays bishop b6, and then I can yes. take on b7, and what's following next is and, on e7, and I'm winning. And here, for example, in case of king g7, because he doesn't have much moves, then this is the easiest way ah. in converting your winning position. Okay. Okay, very good. This was just the warm up. My next topic, I will not tell you because it will give you too many hints, but it's a positional topic. Okay. And we will basically now start to study um, old games, but with a rich, sorry, with a rich character um, of positional understanding on second okay. i will just copy the fan very good where you're doing that okay. i'm going to give a quick shout out to wgm adriana nikolova who is in chat who is a fellow streamer and a dear friend please give adriana a follow and she has a great channel and uh, i'm very happy to see her here Welcome, Adriana. And for those of you who have joined us a bit, little bit later, this is Nicola Studies Chess with International Master Elizabeth Pecht. Uh, this is a weekly 7 a.m. Eastern uh, lesson, it, it, which uh, Elizabeth uh, puts unsolvable problems in front of me, and I try my best to solve them. Anyway, hey, Tapesta, it's very good to see you. It's very good to see you. Anyway, all right, so you're i'm i'm white in this position you are black you have to switch the colors okay. because if you are white it's too easy you have a winning position after bishop takes a six by position right. means 
All right, so now if I remember this, and I actually studied this, these positions a little bit with, with Danya, mm -hmm. uh, this is one of those cases when uh, playing g5 should seriously be considered. Obviously, because, okay, anyway, I mean, one of the unofficial rules is like when you are under attack, yeah. always check the active defense before you go for the passive one. I mean, here, basically, in this position, it's true. You have only two candidate moves. You have bishop e7 or g5. Yeah, yes. All right, and just uh, for those of you who have just joined us, this is, uh, again, Nicolas Tadis Chess with its one and only international pastor, Elizabeth Pechts better known as Miss Messi. And I'm here every every Wednesday at 7 a.m. and trying to solve problems that she poses. All right, so, so here uh, we are trying to, to choose between bishop e7 and g5. All right, so if I, am, if I play g5, I need to seriously consider an option of uh, a white uh, sacrificing the knight on g5. Yes, this is the most crucial one. You have to be sure yeah. that you are not getting troubles yeah. there. Okay, and the other option is uh, a little bit passive bishop, uh, bishop e7, and those two moves need to be seriously considered. All right, so let's look at the g5. Knight g5 takes, 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 and then what do we do afterwards? Uh, the knight is attacked twice and needs to be defended. So I need to play bishop e7 to defend the knight because I don't think king g7, actually king g7 is another candidate move there, but that loses the queen, so it's not a viable option. All right, so what we need to do is we need to play bishop e7 and white doesn't seem to have any checks because g4 is defended twice so and queen f3 is a is a interesting move but then do we have time to play something along the lines of um, queen queen g7 but the queen is on the eight nicola Correct. No, meaning King G, um, King G seven defended. The idea is to bring the rook to bear. So I'm I'm trying to figure out what is the critical line in this position, and I think the critical line of G five is Knight takes Bishop uh, H G five Bishop G five Bishop E seven Queen F three. Right. One second before you calculate queen f3 because queen f3 is not good because I can catch her on d5 with my knight. Yes, and, and then that loses the pieces, correct. So yeah. you should first take on e7 to get the pin active yeah. again. Yeah. Queen yeah. takes e7 and yeah. then queen f3. Okay. All right. Queen f3. All right, queen f3. And can we then play something along the lines of queen e well the knight is attacked twice yes you have to protect it with king g7 so we need yeah. to play king g7 all right and after king g7 what could be the continuation for white in this position the continuation there is a check on g3 it's not a check but it's still like a move it's, which is very it's, inconvenient it's a very inconvenient move that uh, threatens a possible double check or take on f6, okay? Or it threatens f4 to open up the rook and Which then your pin on f6 becomes okay. horrible. All right. So um, we cannot play, can we, we cannot play any intermezzo along the lines of bishop g4 because that's gonna, black can just take and then we're down a piece. Mm -hmm. But what do you think, Nicola, just by your feelings after queen g3 in the whole line you calculated, would you like to be black here? It's a very unpleasant position. It is actually like, okay, it's close to be lost, but okay, this is because I know it, but uh, the thing is like after queen g3, your king is very weak. You're not 
in time to get your rook somehow to g8 and no. hide your king behind it. I will play f4 and I will just basically kill you with this position. But right. yeah. once again, when you did all this calculation, are you sure that you always considered all the candidate moves when you started to calculate g5? Because what you did right now is a typical automatism yes. of doing things which are just coming to your mind without even looking for alternatives of candidate moves yep, because yep. you missed one okay very good and i actually i actually remember <coughs> i actually remember you telling that to maria yesterday so okay yes, all, right. I <laughs> all right so let's consider this we can play so let's say we play g5 mm-hmm and I think the uh, there is a check in the position, which is knight f6, which I don't think is a serious candidate move. No, but after g5, knight takes g5. Then if you there is knight, what I didn't look at is there is a knight d5 option. Obviously, because okay, it's capture variations, and since there are no checks, you should always consider yeah. all the captures. Correct. So instead of capturing on g5, I can capture on d5. Uh -huh. And after capture on d5, then white has a choice what to do. Option one. The, I don't think white has any meaningful checks. Actually, doesn't think white has any checks. No checks in the air. After that position, uh, the white can take on d5. That's one option. Mm -hmm. Option number two is to um, play a move like uh, Queen H5. Yes. Which may or may not be a good good move. Uh, we, that needs to be evaluated. Uh, there is also an option of uh, what other options does White have? I mean, basically, like you see that the bishop on h4 indirectly hits the queen on d8. So you should consider also any knight moves and the yeah. consequences of those moves, obviously. All right. The option, one candidate move is to return the return the knight to f3, after mm -hmm. which point we can probably even, a candidate move is to play knight e7. Yes, and, and that's good enough because... We are peace up. up. Mm -hmm. So that knight f3 move is not a viable option. Another option is something along the lines of knight e6 or knight f7 or knight h3, but in that case, the bishop on h4 is undefended. Very good. Yep. So, 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 so I think instead of taking on g5, which is a very uncomfortable position, I think the the move we should seriously because we should play is knight d5 yes so i mean g5 basically is the best move in this position because you cannot capture on g5 because of knight takes d5 if yes. here yeah. you take on d5 i can capture on g5 everything is fine i think a move like queen h5 i can probably just take the second piece and after bishop takes g5, in the worst case, I have bishop e7, but I may have even some kind of in between, I mean, intermediate moves like knight f4, followed up by f6. There is no check on g6. And even if I give back one piece, I'm still a piece up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So instead of g5, I mean, in case of bishop e7, just to um, briefly uh, show that, then I think for black, uh, for white, the easiest solution to get a slightly better position is to capture on e7 and then to capture on f6 and play knight d2. And here white is slightly, I mean, preferable because, okay, good structure and everything is. Yeah, and there's the f4 plan, so. Okay, now what do you think, um, Nicola, after g5, yeah. What is, by laws of positional play, the stronger move? Bishop g3 or knight takes f6? I can tell you that both moves lead to a very bad position for um, for white in any case, but still just from the laws of positional understanding. Knight takes f6 or bishop g3? Um, well, 
they both, I mean, that bishop is going to end up on g3 regardless, right? Yes. So I would, I, I think I would not, uh, I mean, that knight of d5 is reasonably well placed. So I think I would just play bishop g3. So you think like after bishop g3, knight takes d5, e takes d5. That's one option to get. I will just show you just that you have oh, a look at it. Yeah. Uh, if we're talking here about uh, what's the better pawn structure, and that's uh, you know obviously pawn structure in which the pawn is e4 is preferable for the over the pawn structure which the pawn is on d5. I mean, what I my question was rather like whether you think that this position is the better outcome for white, or whether the position after knight takes f6, queen takes f6, bishop g3 is the better outcome for white when we speak about structure and rules of positional play. Uh, well, in terms of structure, this is a better position. I'm not sure that having this knight on f3 and not having a potential outpost on e4, but the problem with outpost on e4 that invites f5. Mm -hmm. On top of it, this position kind of uh, targets the pawn on e5, which limits the black's options a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I would prefer this position that's now on the board. Yes, I mean you're right because from I mean that I mean just to 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 say it already in advance. In any case, the position for white is horrible, no matter what of these two options he or she would choose from. But from the positional rules and laws of chess, that structure is much better because okay, now if you push ever f five, then you end up with a kind of uh, isolated pawn, whereas if you um, allow the capture on d5, you give a majority in the center by the pawn structure. Okay, I cannot push f5 immediately, but I can prepare it with f6, queen e7, bishop d7, rook e8, and sooner or later I will be ready to push f5. So just from the loss of structure, this is the worst scenario for white, but since that position is bad anyway, it doesn't matter what white would have done. In the game, actually, after g5, um, white captured on f6, queen f6, and bishop g3 was played. Now, once again, Nicola, it's your turn to digest a move here. Okay, uh, no checks, no meaningful captures, at least not to the extent I see. Uh, no pawn breakthroughs, maybe c4, but that appears to be a little premature. Um, we don't have any threats against the king or, or the queen or the rooks. Bishop g4 appears to be a nice active move. Uh, and uh, just as a future strategic plan, maybe, you know, exchanging the exchanging the let me think for a second is it beneficial for us to exchange this bishop and the for the light square bishop for the for the knight and then exchange queens maybe or do we plan or is it better plan to play queen e7 and then maybe push f5 the problem with f5 is the pawn on e5 ends up being weak Another alternative is to push c4, uh, maybe open up the f file and uh, put the bishop on c5, target f2. Mm. We can also decide that we're going to attack in this position. All right, so we can play h5, for example. Uh -huh which basically seems to going to result into rather untimely demise of the white king because we can push a queen g7 rook h8 attack on the h file um so that's one move another move is bishop g4 uh, which you know 
I would honestly play this as a, a traditional King's Indian type of position and I would play h5. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Nicola, the funny part is like that from the, your intuitional point of view, the first move which was jumping into your mind was bishop g4, right? Yes. Because that was the one you mentioned first. Yeah. Then you started to have a deeper look at it and you decided to do a kind of kingside attack. Let's just forget about um, all the ideas and make an evaluation of this position. So we compare the kings, we can say both kings more or less for now are safe. Then we compare already the material. Material is equal, pawn okay. structure. Okay, it's better for white because we have this double pawn. And the next um, category is peace activity. Okay. And here with peace activity, I mean, what are the good pieces and what are the bad pieces in this position? Okay. All right, so good piece for What is a good piece for white? Mm -hmm. um, there aren't any at this very point because this knight is basically being dominated by pawns. Okay, but let's it ask. Can different go, it can maybe go to d2 and c4 at some point. Yes, so uh, probably it, in the next move, even knight d2 yeah. is one of the candidates. Yes. So let's. So I, I, if I were to, if you were asking me what is the best best piece, what was best white piece, I would say it's the knight. Yes. Uh, if you're asking me what is the so, what's the worst piece? It's this uh, bishop on g3 because that doesn't have many prospects. It's a tall pawn. Um, yes. What is the future? prospect of that bishop if white has time to do something about it uh there it's still dim because one possibility there is to push h4 which is dangerous because it's opening up the white king the problem is that even after h4 we can say follow it up with g4 and that bishop is still not going anywhere it's going to end up on h2 and it's uh, it's basically hitting this pawn on e5 and it's basically biting granite hey, this Schubert is awesome. thank you for the follow sorry sorry elizabeth no problem this is true but i mean like objectively let's say you play h5 in this position i will answer with h4 Yep. Because, okay, I will not get myself squeezed in. Now you have to play g4, because if you take on h4, I mean, like, uh, my position even improves. So knight d2. And then in the future, I will always have the option to play f3, yes. which means I can maneuver my bishop to any other diagonal besides open up the king side. And my bishop for now is bad, but in the future, it has hopes. Okay. And now check out... How big are the hopes of that bishop if you would start with bishop g4? If I start with bishop g4, that uh, bishop, we, it's, that bishop is basically, let's assume that uh, we play bishop g4, we take on f3, and the queens get it off the board. Yes, but not only the queens get off the board, also the double pawn structure will arise. Yeah, and there is no f3 option anymore. Uh huh. The topic of today of this game is excluded pieces. But if I had told you that, then sure. Bishop G4 was an obvious move because it's clear that after I exchange on F3, that bishop becomes equal to a pawn because it will not do anything anymore in this game. It is out. So, um, objectively speaking or indirectly, we can say after Bishop G4, we are winning a piece, which is still on the board. Mm -hmm but which basically will never ever see sunshine in his life again. Yeah. Yep, and basically the difference between this position and the position after h5, h4, g4 is that there is no f3 option in this position. Okay. Never right. ever again, unless yep. you yep. sacrifice a lot of pawns to yep. do that. Understood. 
So after bishop g4 in the game, h3 was played. Now capture and here white took with the queen because probably he was hoping that the end game would give him better chances than if he had taken with the pawn when the king additionally is weak. But even here, there is no need to play on the king side because you just make sure that the bishop will be close forever. Your idea is to do something on the other side, but we will see it in the game. Okay. So queen takes f3 was played. Of course, the queens were exchanged. And now we have a following situation on the board where we should kind of develop a long-term plan. What do you think, Nicola? Where shall we try to develop a long-term plan? Where shall we play? What should we try to achieve? We should develop the plan on the queen side. And yes. Here is a rough plan is play f6. Very good. This double is what the, happened. Double the rooks on d5, push c4. Something like that, but the thing is like that here in the end game, sometimes you must have heard about the theory of the principle of two weaknesses. We got the weakness on g3, but in order to win the game, that will not be enough. We have to create a weakness on the other side yeah. in order to really execute. Here, Capablanca started with f6 because, first of all, he makes sure that um, his opponent will lose all his hopes of that bishop. Second of all, f6 is coming very handy as my king should also be activated yep. later on. Okay. So now in the game after um, f6, king g2 was played. And here black pushed a5. So it is time to get some space on the other side. And what do you think? Um, what is the idea of a5 if black is one time more to move here? What would black do? Uh, okay, and just a quick uh, thank you for Eastern. Thank you for stopping by. It's very good to see you. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day. All right, so. And Finn's Tofurs, thank you for the follow. Zombie Sent 3, thank you for the follow. Very greatly appreciate it. Thank you, guys. All right, so we are, all right, so so this is Capablanca's game, so that's, okay, so what what we're trying to achieve here is to a, um, hey, Grom217, thank you for the follow, and guys, we need only 50 more follows to 2,500, the 2,500 followers, we're going to have some fun content. So just wanted to let you know, I'm looking forward to that milestone. All right, so what we basically want to do is we want to push those pawns and uh, open up the position. Uh, yeah. And uh, a5 is useful because, let's say, some sort of... A, uh, we want to... We want to pick up the pawn challenge of our own choosing. So instead of, as I think c4 is, has a problem that it can be responded to d4 with a potential opening up of that bishop. So uh, we, are, we are basically creating some sort of a pawn challenge option on the queen side for us, where we're going to target. And we have three pieces to attack a target and there are only two possible defenders because of that bishop on g3 okay and just imagine it is black one more time to move what would black do here yes huh. um, okay we can we can keep pushing the pawns we can play b5 Okay, I mean, b5 is always an option, but you should be very careful in a way if white gets a control of c4, then okay. your last breaking through or your last possible break is gone. But we will get later to the game. I ask you the question because here it's not only about like ideas, it's also about space advantage, which means that if white is doing something, let's say h4 or something, then black would try to push even a4 yeah. and try to fix already that guy, which means at some point maybe rook a5, rook b5, he would provoke that he would move b3, and then we would get back to the a file and try to open up the position this way. Okay. 
So for this reason, after a5, white responded with a4 because white didn't want to lose space because after a4, we get a guy into the camp of our opponent, which is automatically meaning we gain space. Mm -hmm. And with a4, I am meeting that. And here, now after a4, um, however, we get already the first connection point. And the connection point here to open up and to do something is b5. Is b5 which is already useful. If he hadn't given us that connection point, yeah. then we would have created this with, with a4, rook a5, rook b5, and then bringing the other rook with such ideas. Yeah. Okay, a5 was played in the game, a4 was responded. So we can play c6, I presume? Yeah, c6 was played later. He went for king f7 okay. first because there is nothing wrong to get the king on e6 in any case. Okay, so here is a question that I'm just going to ask myself. Uh, is it beneficial for white to play h4 and then hope to open up the, the h file? That is what happened in the game. But um, okay. let's imagine... I will push h4, rook h1. I mean, rook h1 actually happened in the game. Okay. And then I will capture on g5, like h takes g5, h takes g5. And let's even assume I get my rook on h7 while my king will be on a6. This is the scenario which could happen. And mm -hmm. the question is with the king on e6 and the rook on h7, is there anything we have to be worried about? Well, the black king is basically in uh, in stalemate. In other words, uh, there is a potential mating threat, though it's not immediately obvious how can that can happen. I mean, the mating threat would be the square on e7, but my bishop is guarding it well. You don't have any um, pieces which could be on light squares because the f5 and d5 mating um, squares cannot be approached with the pawns. Yeah. So the king on e6 is actually rock safe. And even if you manage to install two rooks on the seventh yeah, rank, which is seven x seven, and yeah. still everything is absolutely under control, which means that Capablanca could easily ignore the whole ideas of white because yeah. white can't do much. So after rook h1, he went for king e6, okay. h4. Now rook b8 was played okay he took twice and now white played b3 what do you think next move okay um and just a very quick uh, hi magnus no Carlson. it's very good to see you hello isolator thank you and welcome bad rush and for those of you who have just joined us we have this is a weekly feature of on my channel. It's uh, Nicholas Tadis Chess with one and all international master Elizabeth Pecht. So it's uh, I am here having a fun time studying the games of the greats. So being tortured, in other words. Anyway, <laughs> uh, all right. So basically, what I'm what I'm he's, he's, uh, hearing here is that Capablanca doesn't necessarily. Okay, so um, let me think about this for a second. Um, Capablanca doesn't want to exchange rooks for the simple reason that if we exchange rooks, uh, black actually has a huge complex of light squares that are weak and that, that black king can take advantage of. So if I'm white and uh, rooks are not on the board, I can play king h3, king g4, and although I have a very bad bishop that king can roam free a little bit though I'm not sure that's good enough so Capablanca chose not to play rook h8 well he just played rook hb8 actually this was his yeah. last move I mean yeah. kind yeah. of his last yeah. move Okay. b3 and now my 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 question was like how to proceed here and you are right if I exchange both rooks actually the game is immediately drawn because yeah. white will push c4 even yeah. if you manage to get some with something with b5 i ignore it the king goes to g4 and you can both sign the score sheets immediately yeah so basically that's yeah and i don't have any pawn 
breakthrough anymore. C6, B5, two pawns ain't happening. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so, um, same time, same same time each week. This is a this is a weekly. Um, all right. So the idea here is to push C6 and play C6, B5. Uh, and the question here is, we still have that C4 locking down. Uh, the question I have is, does it make sense to sacrifice the pawn to open up that bishop? Uh, okay. All right. So if black is on the move, mm -hmm. um, What should black not play? Let's put it like this. Which move black should not play here in this position? Well, it shouldn't exchange rooks. And it, I don't think it makes sense to play b5. Very good. b5 would be a horrible mistake because after b5, you will never ever break through again because I can capture, capture, play rook a4 and, and the game is wrong. Yeah, against the draw, I'm not sure that white is not. Well, white is not better, but it's uh, yeah, okay. It's strong. I mean, white cannot win because he yeah. cannot get his bishop to d2. Otherwise, we would, of course, speak again who is better. But this is not real. Yeah. See, so we are, we have to play c6. Yes, yeah, c6 happened in the game. Very good. After c6, I have to check what happened because okay. uh, c6. Ah, rook a2 was played. Okay. Next move. Well, I see no, okay, so I see no reason not to continue with the plan, right? So we can play yes. B, B5. Yes, B5 and now Rook A1 happens. And here we have a crucial moment in the game. Yeah. Where we have to take a decision on how to continue. Okay. Um, hey, I hope, uh, young, uh, Young man, so thank you for joining the stream and I hope you enjoyed Queen's Gambit. I'm actually looking forward to having uh, a rest day, so I'm going to binge watch it. I haven't watched it yet. Hi, handsome geek. It's very good to see you. All right, so the A5 is a potential weakness, so we need to solidify that so we can play something along the lines of bishop c7, but that's uh, not uh, an immediate concern. Immediate concern here is the strategic plan. Because uh, white is not going to oblige us to play and take on b5. Mm -hmm. So bishop c7 is, of course, a move which would not give you any headaches because we prophylactically protect yeah. the pawn on a5. What other moves this position may offer and which are worth to be considered? Okay, uh, take on a4 would work in white's favor, so that's not a candidate move. Mm -hmm. um, King is extremely well placed on e6. I don't see any way to improve King's position. Uh -huh. um, let's assume we, so we have an option of playing, you know, to reinforcing, and I'm not sure it's the right move. We can play c4 uh -huh. and then bust that, uh, you know, try to undermine white's structure. So you have a choice between c4 and bishop c7, that means. Now make a choice. I will just quickly close the curtains because I get too much sun. And okay. you can think about sure. c4 or bishop c7. Okay. That's what all that's uh, what we are hoping for here, young Mesa. We all want to be to improve, maybe not improve to the extent to become grandmasters, but uh, you know, we'll see. Um, all right. Well, I think, uh, you know, taking on b5, taking on b5, we, we don't want white to take on a5, right? Yes, okay. I mean, so after, we, the thing is like after c4, you have to do some calculations, obviously. Yeah. And you should once again try to look at all the yeah. candidates. Yeah. All right, so we, I think we're playing. The problem is that we have a chance. Well, let me see for a second. Um, we have a chance to play c4 now because white can actually play c4. 
Well, if, for example, like I play bishop c7 and white would play c4, that's nothing to worry about no. because you will get our second weakness by just capturing. Correct. You have to capture yeah. here and we enter. Yeah. And, and that's more. A, and we have, a, we have an open file and then we have yes. weaknesses on d3 and a4. So the, white cannot. We have time to prepare. All right. So let's assume that the line is I play bishop c7. Mm -hmm. And. I don't know what white can play. White will probably play king f1 and then maybe king e2. Okay. That would be a reasonable plan. Yeah. Actually, one interesting exercise would be to just say, is white better if we remove the pawn on f2? Is it better position for white because it has a better bishop? But that's a hypothetical question. Uh, Okay. Well, if you sacrifice a pawn with f4, I will take with the e pawn in this case, and then my bishop gets on the sure. diagonal h8, a1, and that would be even probably worse than trying to get that bishop out. No, 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 I, I understand that. It's just, uh, uh, anyway, all right. So, so bishop c7, king f1, and then we need to consider c4. Uh, c4 if he take yeah we are basically if you play c4 we are gonna open up the b file All right or no well if, if white takes we take b file is gonna end up being open and then we have multiple weaknesses to take advantage of and we control the b file if so that means your move is c4. My move is, uh, I would, I would probably, if, let's see. You mean let's calculate c4. That makes sense because so to decide by intuition sure. doesn't make sense. So after c4, what are the options for white? In this position, without uh, yes. first playing bishop c7. Okay. Yeah. All right. So bishop c4. Uh, I'm gonna be greedy a little bit, as white, and I'm gonna take on b5. Okay, so after c4, a takes b5. What yeah. is the answer here by black? The answer for black is not... Obviously, we don't want to take on b5 because then we lose the pawn on a5. Yes, also, yes. So we need to take one of the two pawns with our c4 pawn instead. Mm-hmm. And uh, so what we want to do here is we probably should take the B pawn. Yes, very good. Because, okay, C takes B3 just forces um, a reaction by white as the yeah. rook on A2 is hanging. Yeah. And then white can play rook A5. And if we exchange on a five, we exchange the rooks a five, so we have a b two, and that pawn actually promotes. So he white cannot right. take on a five, and we're Absolutely winning. Absolutely correct. Yes. Okay. So so yeah. So we should actually play c four in this position. Yes, c four is just a winning move because you use the fact that you have this intermediate reaction just something briefly for everybody if here white tries to win a pawn it's not really a pawn win because we have rook b4 rook takes c4 and then also white ends up with a lot of weaknesses hey lolly my friend it's very good to see you thank you for thank you for being here and so thank you Neil okay. Neil 101 for the follow i'm apologies okay yeah in the game, a takes b5 was played. Um, yeah. Capablanca took on b3. C takes b3 and went for rook takes b3. Yeah. And then actually not so many things happened. I just, sorry, I just misclicked my game. Let's just go back. Hey, Canard I... Futur, we are watching a Capablanca's game. You, uh, you, you missed... Uh... The, the analysis that focuses on the bishop on g3, which is basically out of combat. It's uh, yes. having a very nice vacation there on g3. For a long time, for the internal game. So rook a4 was played in the game. Now Capablanca simply took on b3. Okay. 
And after taking on b3, the last try by winter was to push d4. So now what do you think? What is the easiest way here of keeping the advantage without any headaches and no calculations involved? Uh, well, just uh, bishop b4. Okay, bishop b4 actually also works fine. Um, this wasn't played, but bishop b4 is one option. I mean, important it is not to capture on d4 and wake up the guy on g3. Capablanca went for rook b5 in this position, okay. actually, which okay. is as good. And after rook c4, he went for rook b4, which means he would exchange either the rooks or those two pawns. In the game, after rook takes c6 and rook takes d4, winter resigned. Yeah, yeah, the, the, there is a, there is a distant pass pawn on a file and there is no counterplay. Yes, and for this reason, actually, um, yeah, just to sum up the game, it was basically this decided after bishop g4, we can say, because there was no bishop on g3 in the game anymore. And then all you need to do is to create a second weakness, which was successfully achieved by Capablanca. Very good. Now we go into the next game between Boleslavski and Smyslov. And for a surprise, it was Smyslov being totally outplayed. Okay, that's and always good was, to see. And the, he was a god of end games, I can tell you. So it is very rarely that Smyslov and Spassky's could be outplayed in end games. Yeah. As a side note, I remember watching the candidates final. I think it was in 1983 or 1984 in which Smyslov played against young Garry Kasparov. And he gave, uh, he actually won an end game. He led that match by winning an end game against Kasparov and gave Kasparov a very hard time. And Smyslov was 60 at the time. So that was impressive. Just wondering why I can't copy the position as I want to, but maybe I'll do it like this. Uh, who is the best chess player in, player in the world? Well, um, you know, the title belongs to Magnus Carlsen. And I think it's fair to say that right now he is the best chess player in the world in the classical time, fr in the classical time frame. Um, in uh, Blitz, I think there, there are plenty of potential challengers, but right now in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of classical time play, Magnus is the best. Is he the best ever? Um, I kind of have a policy when asked that question to not include people who are still in the prime of their careers, because we really don't know uh, what's Ma what Magnus is going to do in the next couple of years. So outside of Magnus, my favorite uh, candidate for best ever are somewhere between Aljahin and, uh, and Kasparov. And anybody who has ever been in the United States has a soft spot for Fisher and Morphe. Um, what Fisher did in 1970, which he took on the whole Soviet school and basically beat them was uh, was probably something that cannot be replicated today. So uh, that's probably longer longer answer, young message than you hope to hear. But there you go. That's that's a fair answer, I would think. Anyway, sorry, Elizabeth. No problem. We put the second position okay. here in the game. You are white, and you have to do a choice of what to do with your bishop on a four. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm white. Bankinator to answer <clears throat> to answer that question. That question gets answered every which way. There are people who say that Morphy was like a twenty two hundred level player. There are uh, people who consider him the best player ever. Uh, by one metric, if you look at the dis distinction. Uh, <clears throat> What was the delta between him and his contemporaries? Morphe is the big, greatest ever <clears throat> because he understood chess significantly better than any of his contemporaries. 
Uh, my take on this thing was that if you give Morphy four or five years to prepare study theory and so on, he would have been a very strong opponent of uh, Magnus Carlsen for the world champion today. And he had photographic memory. So, you know, I think that's probably the fairest answer I can give. But uh, that's, again, this is alternative chess history. Anyway, all right. So I have a bishop on f4. What am I doing? All right. Well, I see a check, therefore I'm going to give a check. I'm just kidding, Elizabeth. Don't don't get upset, please. But, no, I don't get upset. I'm just like uh, giving you the position. I need your thoughts on that because I will not keep you the topic. Otherwise, it might be a bit easier for you. Hey, Kisoka, my friend. It's very good to see you. Uh, all right, so what am I doing here? What am I doing here is I'm considering, you know, I can't leave it there because it's under attack. I can play bishop g3 in which I am, uh, I'm, it's going to guard that pawn for the rest of the game, which is probably not a good idea. Uh, I can play against the white black pawn structure, give a check on d5. G5, sorry, check on G5, and then if black plays F6, takes, stakes, and then we move it somewhere, and we have, black has a worse pawn structure, but an open G file, and I think that transaction favors black, so we're not giving a check on G5. We are probably not pushing it to G3, because that E5 pawn doesn't appear to need immediate protection, it's not under attack, and it's not immediately obvious how black can attack it. Bishop E3 doesn't work, because exchange results into double pawns. Though that does give a little uh, question mark for the knight on F4, because it's kind of trapped, but that's a destroyed pawn structure. I mean, I would probably need more than that to play bishop e3, though. Anyway, bishop c1 is a blocking, uh, is basically disconnecting the rooks, and then we have an optional play bishop d2, which does close the uh, d file, but then we can, we have, we can put rook a d1 and then maybe even push bishop back to c1 or something like that all right so that's my chain of consciousness thought. okay of course you are like i can also play g3 but i'm pretty sure we don't want to do that yes um you are once again not once again but you are misled by your automatism yes which is typical but before actually like we get to the right move let's let me ask you other questions. I mean, yes, we have okay. equal material. The kings more or less are both safe. So what do you think are the strongest pieces for white? What are the weakest pieces for white? What are the strongest pieces for black? And what are the weakest pieces for black? And let's skip the rooks. Let's only concentrate on the minor pieces. Sure. Well, uh, and I have to say, I'm, I'm going to push back Elizabeth a little bit. You asked me a leading question. A leading question is, where are you putting your bishop? It was not to analyze the position. Just kidding. No. <laughs> yes, just but no, I just asked you what to do, what you would do now. I was not right. asking no, no, you no, like no, the, the bishop. <laughs> anyway. Um, so the strongest uh, black piece uh, is looks appears to be that bishop on c5 because it's uh, centrally positioned, targets the f2 pawn, and it's uh, it's it's a very well developed bishop uh second you know that uh, <clears throat> that's obviously the strongest uh black piece the uh -huh. strongest white piece is um that's actually a good question uh well it i would say one of the knights because knight on c3 has a nice uh, prospect on e4 and again park itself on d6 and that's very nice outpost um 
so I would call that to be the best piece. The knight on b5 is <clears throat> is good, but uh, uh, it needs to be defended because it's under attack. I prefer knight on c3. Okay, let's uh, let's agree that the knights actually here are doing a great job. What about the worst pieces in white's position? Well, this uh, bishop on g3, we need to do something with it. So, I mean, like when we just by logical means, we understand we yeah. have a very strong square on d6, which could be approached by the knights. Yeah. We yeah. understand that the strongest piece of black is the bishop. We yeah. understand that our sorrow child is that bishop. So once again, I ask you, yeah. where to go with the bishop? We're going to play bishop e3 and forget yes. about the pawn structure. No, that, I mean, yeah, it's... <laughs> it's an uh, i was getting there but yes no i mean like what what i want to explain to you is like okay mm. you said i mean this is very typical that's why I, I love this kind of example because most most players would not go to e3 because ah double pawn that structure i cut it okay I'm but they gonna, don't i'm just gonna make one observation for my friend hisoka and just a quick uh, good morning to hellstorm angel and reship 27 Hisoka, I'm not Andromeda. I'm not judging positions based solely on the pawn structure. We have a we have a dear friend and actually a very good developing chess player called Andromeda who judges positions exclusively on pawn structures. And he would not play Bishop E3 if that was an immediately winning move. So yeah, so Beer playing Bishop E3, what that does is first it neutralizes the best black piece. Also, once we exchange, we have that knight on uh, h5 doesn't have a doesn't have f4 anymore, and on top of it, all of a sudden, the knight on b5 has an outpost on d4. Yeah, on d6, yes. And on d6, yes. And uh, so, yeah. Yes, and besides, one more advantage is after bishop e3. The f5 is open. Yes. G4 is a threat. Knight e6 yes. is coming. So um, basically here, bishop e3 yeah. is by far the best move. I mean, bishop g5, yeah. is like an automatic move, a lot of players would do in a bits game. And also here, white is better. But at least after f6, I have to exchange my trump card because the pawn on e5 was giving me space advantage yeah. and the control over the square d6. And after g takes f7, on top of that, the knight has now also options to go back to g7 and maybe later on to f7, mm -hmm. and white can black <clears throat> can at least move again. Well, I can't vouch for myself in a bullet game, but in a blitz, just uh, having the open g file and then potential bishop c6. Six, yes. So it's not all a this is one. not. Yeah, I wouldn't play that, but yeah. But <laughs> the strategy, what I think Elizabeth is doing very successful is. Basically, forget about the pawn structure with the concrete position, and bishop e3 oh, yeah. is uh, is a. No, basically, move. what I wanted to give as a message: forget about the automatic sorts, yes. like which you know, like double pawns are bad pawns, and this is bad because of that. Forget about these automatic things. Always try to consider, like yeah. what actually happens after that bad things you think you may get yeah, because if i had if i had asked you after bishop e3 bishop e3 f3 evaluate this position you would suddenly realize that these double pawns are great in a way yes. because yeah. Yeah. the knight is cut off the d6 square the f7 file and you would immediately like uh, go back with your judgment that bishop yeah. e3 is not a good option yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, young Mesut, to answer the question about what do chess players go crazy, I think it's uh, fair to say, I think the right answer to that question is that in many cases, and we can talk about Fisher, it's uh, chess that connects some of the people who had predilections to being uh, crazy, uh, connects them to reality. That was definitely the case with Fisher, and that was definitely the case with Morphe. So, in other words, that's what kept them connected to reality. So, anyway, but that's okay. a much longer answer. And I, uh, if I give you a longer answer, that would sound like a lecture uh, on a lecture class and Elizabeth would kill me. So, let's... Uh, <laughs> anyway, 
Thank you, Digan okay. Good to see you here. Thanks. All right. So yeah. since Black understood, and I mean Black was Smyslov, that Bishop takes E3 would get him even into bigger troubles, he went for rook A C eight. Okay. Now it's once again your move here to continue the game. I mean, you have to suggest a move here. Isn't the pawn all right? So we can play g4 and ask the question from that knight where it goes, right? Okay, after rook h8, why your alarm bell should start to ring? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I'm gonna play that immediately. My bishop on c4 is unprotected and so on and uh -huh. so forth. No, no worries, I'm not blundering a piece, um, but uh. That knight is on the back of my head being uh, undefended. Yeah. All right, so um, so I can All right, so candidate moves are obviously I need to take care of that bishop on um, I need to take I need to defend that bishop on C4. The question here is, do I, if I take, I can take on c5 and then I'm not damaging my structure anymore, but then I have to defend uh, some sequence. I'm basically activating one of the black pieces, either the knight or the rook on c5. So that's not a good idea to exchange on c5. You would lose a pawn besides because of the double attack. Yeah. Okay, maybe not the pawn, but still, like, there is no. some issues. Yeah, so I'm just gonna, so I can be, I can be coy and play b3, or I can be um, sneaky and play bishop e2 and attack that, that knight. Which of those two options is obviously the stronger move? Bishop e2. Of course, because it's the active defense. You don't lose time. Yeah. You solve your problem. You yeah. create a counter attack. And besides, the bishop on that diagonal was not doing anything anyway. No, on top of it, pawn would be to defend the knight on c3, which is actually relevant in some variations. Yes. So bishop e2 was played in the game. And the answer by black was g6. There was not much of an option. Okay. Next move, Nicola. Okay. It's still tempting to give the check on g5, but that doesn't work for the same reasons that we already outlined. Um, all right, so what is our weakest piece in this position? Uh, the weakest piece in this position is, believe it or not, knight on c3. Very good. So what we can do, we're going to play, place it on e4 and force black to make a decision which is yes and, by far the best move in this game yeah. very good okay. knight e4 was played i mean some of you may consider even moves like bishop takes h5 because they would think that i destroy the pawn structure by black but such moves actually like are not beneficial because we exchange a decent bishop with a horrible knight yeah and unless we win big material, there is no need to do this kind of exchanges. And Nicola pointed out correctly, if I look at all my pieces, the knight is crying to get to e4. Yeah. Because and especially after g6, f6 square is weak yeah. in addition. And bishop on c5 is crying to get it, get attacked. So Yes. So now in the game, bishop e3 was played, f3 and rook c2. Next move. Okay. Hey, Davina, it's very good to see you. Good morning. Uh, welcome to WFM Davina. Her, her, she's a fellow streamer and a friend. She goes by uh, Twitch handle Twitch Let's Go and give her a follow and, uh, and check out her channel. She has great, uh, she has great content on her channel. She plays, she, I think I watched her stream with Le Fong, they were playing hand, hand and brain or anyway, it's very good to see you here, Davina. All right, so this is technically a double attack on uh, uh, double attack on pawn on b2 and the bishop. 
Uh -huh. uh, here is a question. Yes. You. Thank you. All right. So we need to do something with. Uh, we don't. We are not counting pawns in this position. Not really, because I mean, there's so many witnesses in Black's camp that the pawn on B2 is not the issue. No. Uh, I don't think we have time to play knight d6 and then take on f7. But oh, uh, maybe we do. Maybe we do. Calculate. No, always I'm sorry. I'm not, uh, <laughs> so, so, in other words, I'm, I, I'm thinking loud. So I haven't dismissed them all. But yeah, we actually do because. Rook e2, rook f7, check on f8, and that uh, nice juicy rook on a8 is ours. Very good. So we're going to ignore it, and we're going to play knight d6. The question here is which knight? Mm -hmm. um, that's actually a good question. Before you think deeply about it, what is your intuition saying? Just intuition. Um, well, we complained about the knight on e4, so I'm just going to move. I, I, intuition says take the knight on, e, knight on e4. On the other hand, uh, that we can blow up the that knight on a6, but again, that's a horrible knight for a decent bishop. So I probably play with knight e4 because there is, appears to be a semblance of a mating knight in there. Okay, but I mean, just imagine you take the other knight on this, uh, to d6. The knight on e4 has still the option, perhaps, to go to g5. Yeah. And yeah. also, maybe later on, to go to f6. But the knight on b5, apart from like attacking a kind of uh, useless pawn on a7. It only has d6. So we're, yeah, 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 exactly. Sorry. Just by this logic, actually, the knight yeah. on b5 makes more sense because my knight on e4 has still targets. But the knight on b5, I mean, a7, we cannot consider a serious target no. because this pawn is no. useless or no, no meanings, I mean, meaningless in this position. Yeah. No, I was also, you know, funny thing is that, and I'm just thinking loud here, is that we can even play a switch, switch and soak and play knight that put that knight on d4, where it actually then, you know, but we don't need to do that. No, knight d6 is actually a brilliant move because, yeah. okay, yeah, we don't need I, to do that. I now force rook f8. There are no other options. Okay. And now, once again, it's you to move. Okay. Because the main question is what to do about the bishop on e2. All right, so let me think for a second. Um, I mean, we have a choice of two knights to capture, none of which we want to capture. Yes, very good. Um, we have a choice of uh, putting the knight, the bishop on d3. Mm -hmm. um, actually, do you have to ask ourselves the question, do we actually need that bishop in this game? That's actually, that's exactly the question. So what is our plan? Uh, the plan is... The, the plan here is... I don't see where we can actually use it productively, to be honest with you. Yes, and if we compare the knight on a6 and the knight on h5, which of those knights can be for us a bit annoying? The knight on a, a knight on h5 prevents our knight to going to f6. But we can always push it away with g4. Uh, we can push it with g4. The other one can potentially go on b4. And on top of, uh, on or top or go to c5 once we move, and that's actually defended. And on top of it, I, I'd rather have double pawn on so a file than the open g file, because that can actually come into play fairly quickly. Because 
you know, all black needs to do is to play this and then, uh, you know, if we do this, that's kind of an immediate threat. Yeah, we're taking on a6. Yes, I mean, taking on a6 makes just perfectly sense. The knight on yeah. h5 is a, is the worst piece in black's position. The knight on a6 has the ability to exchange himself with a knight on e4, at least to try. So for this reason here, the knight was captured. In addition to that, the seventh rank gets weaker when the knight is off the board. Yeah. So next move, Nicola. Okay, we can... All right, so what's the winning position for white here? Uh... All right, so we can continue with a plan and we can push g4. Yes, G4 makes perfectly sense because, yeah. okay, we're trying to um, gain the square on F6. And here the last possibly chance for Black was to push F5. But even that position will be much worse after I capture on H5, you capture on E4, I capture on F8, and I go Rook F1 and penetrate on the seventh rank. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's not pleasant. So, I mean, like your king is just very weak, which means, for example, after king g8, you can even like either rook f7 or first h6. But in both cases, like black's king is very weak, and this knight will, um, well, the knight is basically our trump card to win the game. Okay. After g4, knight g7 was played, and actually, the game lasted two more moves, and black resigned. Okay. All right, so what is the natural? So we need to bring the bring this rook on a1 into play because that's one piece we don't have, right? So what are we doing? We can, and the best piece of black is this rook on c2. So, yes. so you know, immediate candidate move is to just play rook to a c1 and then pop the rook down on c7 unless black exchanges. Uh, but we can also solidify what we have and just prevent any f5 threats with playing knight f6. Yes, knight f6 basically forces bishop c6 because uh, you need to do something about... I mean, you cannot prevent um, knight takes h7 and rook takes f7. So, I mean, after knight f6, rook h8 will also lose the game because I can, hypothetically speaking, just capture on f7. Uh, on d7, then on f7, and then win the piece. Yeah. All right, so knight f6 appears to be a natural move. Mm -hmm. So after bishop c6, what then could be a strong candidate to follow up? Well, we need to block the battery the pointing on g2. Uh, we can... I mean, we can play e4. Yes, e4 is actually like uh, one option to solve the issue. We but it's it rook f2 is getting closer to what actually we are looking for but what would be the most active defense after bishop c6 hey adriana thank you for gifting a sub to uh, forward uh, paying forward the gift you got from Dirk. Yeah, thank you very much adriana that's very greatly appreciated thank you all right, so we played knight f6, bishop c6, right? Yes, and then actually find the most active move, um, which is solving the problem. And already like creates a counterattack indirectly and forced um, Smyslov actually to resign the game. Well, can we play rook a c1 and yes. just ignore? Yeah, we can. And then the bishop on c6. Uh, yeah, that's the But which, which rook are we taking, actually? That's also interesting. Rook oh, no. a c1 or rook f1? One because we don't want to put the king on h1. So Yes, yes. that's how the game basically finished. Yeah. Knight f6, rooks, uh, bishop c6 and rook f c1. And here, um, black resigned because, okay, yeah. he... Otherwise, it's actually a draw. If I do a c1 because it's g2, c2, g2, c2, right? No, it's not the draw because I but can always we'll, then we can e4. play a4, but it's annoying. Okay, yeah, I mean, there's no need at least. I mean, yeah. also, rook a c1 is winning the game, but uh, we don't need to have headaches 
on calculations. No, no, no. I hear you. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Hey, Storm2709. Storm it's very good to see you here. Welcome. But this okay. game basically underlines that from the moment after bishop e3, all the moves happened with a temple. Like bishop e2 giving no time to your opponent. Then knight e4 again creating an attack. So everything which was played here by Boleslavski was coming with pressure, which means that Black had no time to do something by himself. And that also underlines the um, effect of an active defense and to always aim for the active defense before you go for the passive approach. So the, the key move here is basically at the very beginning of this position is realizing that bishop e3 is the best move which uh, yeah which requires as as you said uh, disposing with automatism okay uh -huh. right. okay thank you let's, no, this let's... is great and hisoka we're going to show this to andromeda on one or next time we are all in Asserman's channel just uh, just for educational and trolling purposes <laughs> I just have to come up with the next position. Yeah. Because I will just build no it quickly. Right. Um, and so I just copy the fan. Now it's like a different direction of strategy. Okay. But yeah. still it will also test your knowledge a bit. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and you are black here, and it's black to move. Okay, so this looks like some sort of a Sicilian, right? It was likely Sicilian, where at some point black captured on d3 the yeah. bishop. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So hey, Squire three seven seven, thank you for joining the stream. It's very good to see you. And so let's see what. Okay. Okay, so, um, you know, before I go go formal, something along the lines of playing knight g4, and then bishop f6 appears and threatening that rook on c3 appears appealing. I'm not saying that's the right move. Hey, Grim, Grim r4, thank you, for, thank you for the follow. That's very greatly appreciated. That would be the active move in this position. We don't have any checks. I don't see any meaningful captures. Hey, Christus94, thank you again. Thank you for the follow. Very greatly appreciated. Um, I mean, all right. Um, uh, uh, Ellie, am I uh, evaluating this position or am I making a move? Or no, You should make a move here in this position, but of course, like what you should realize is you're playing with a pair of the bishops. Yes. And when you play with a bishop pair in the middle game, there's also rules about the end game, yeah. but there is some general rules which you should always aim for playing with a bishop pair in the middle game what you should try to do or to achieve in general yeah. hey karen it's very good to see you welcome to uh, to karen uh at atlanta chess club thank you for uh thank you for joining us it's very good to see you just a quick shout out to karen and let me see if i can if i know how to type this so Give, uh, give Karen a follow if you already haven't. Her streams are always very instructional and uh, very, very good. And they're geared towards people who have started recently started playing and I found, found them very useful. So, um, okay. Hey, Bedrush, very good. I, I see you guys. So, all right. Going back. Um, so we need to open the position up somehow that would be this the, the idea that's one of the rules playing with the bishop yeah. pair in the middle game aim for open diagonals yeah. aim even like to keep one extra knight on the board as a general rule of course there are always exceptions because with an extra knight on the board your dynamic um counterplay usually increases 
That's uh, another rule. Yep. So John Elias is asking about red tier rifle and red tier rifle would be putting the queen on a8 and then, you know, trying to play along those on, the, uh, on that diagonal. So yeah, that's an option. Um, okay, so how do we open this position that's advantageous for us? We can play, we, for that, we need to open up the center. Mm -hmm. So which kind of move, which is also very typical in Knight of Structures here, are we talking about? Yeah, we're talking about D5. Okay, so after D5, what is White's reaction? Hey, Targaryen, it's very good to see you. Thank you for the follow -up. greatly appreciate it. And guys, we are only 30, 30 followers away from 2,500, so I'm very much looking forward to reaching the milestone. Thank you. All right, so we play D5. We, uh, if we are white, we don't want to open up the position. So I think uh, natural reaction of white would be to push e5 and try to keep the position closed. Absolutely right. So after d5, e5, what are the options for black? Okay, the knight needs to go somewhere. So Do you, I mean, like this is once again, your automatism speaking. Ah, okay. That... What do we know? What do we know when we are on that attack? We move away, we defend, or we create a counterattack. You should never forget these kind of standard rules. Yes. That should be your automatism in your brain in the future in all these kind of moments. Very good. So, but do we, I mean, do we have another option? The, we cannot push d4 because it's attacked. Actually, can we? No, we cannot. Uh, wait, I mean... Uh, you are saying that we cannot because you are, we are sacrificing a pawn or just because you're believing we are losing crucial material? Well, all right. So what, let me, let me think for a second. So mm -hmm. we're going to push d5. White is going to respond to e5. Uh, what we can do there is... We can push d4, and what that would achieve, it will open a diagonal for the bishop on b7. Yes, and we have to check, of course, after d4, what are the options for white to respond? It's a fork, so I don't see that white needs to take the pawn. I mean, what happens if white takes a piece on f6, because it would also attack the piece on e7, right? And then we're going to take on f6 and then white no longer has an option of taking on uh, taking on d4. So we can exclude e takes f6. As we have bishop takes f6, we would protect our forking pawn on d4 and we get a piece back and we are wonderfully happy. Yes. So that means after d4, we have to decide between bishop takes d4 and knight takes d4. What happens after bishop takes d4? After, if we if we do bishop takes e4, we're gonna capture an f3 and we're gonna we're gonna actually collect collect the piece. Well after bishop takes f3, if I capture on f6. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, well, I can st I can capture on. Uh, okay, let me think for a second. Mm -hmm. All right, so the line is e five d five, d five e five d four. Takes with a bishop. Mm -hmm. Bishop takes f three. Bishop takes f three. Uh, and takes f six. Okay, then we can we can actually we can even take on g two with check and play uh, and to, all right we and then we can capture the, the bishop on on the d four. But then I take on e seven and I attack your rook. 
yeah we don't i don't have time to take the knight on c3 so all right um uh, hey Astonoviebo, it's very good to see you so yes i i know you like these positions all right so takes take on f3 take on f6 um and the bishop is actually defending the pawn on f6 so i don't have time I mean, what is the easiest thing? I mean, like after bishop takes f3, e takes f6, we have two pieces against two pieces, but we should be careful not to lose a piece because bishop takes g2 would lose a piece. Yeah. Because uh, after bishop takes g2, I take back, I take on f6, you take back, and I end up with a knight on c3. Understood. So we need to take on f6. Yes, and after taking on f6, we attack d4. If you take on f3, we take on d4 and we have a winning position in all the means, by structure yeah. at least, and by... Well, there is a four, that knight on c3 is forked, uh, so yes. that's already winning. So basically, yeah. after bishop takes f6, the game is winning for black, but we will show it later on the board. So knight takes d4 is the only option, actually, after d4. And after knight yeah. takes d4, what would be the continuation? Okay, um... All right. All right. So the knight is on d4. And we can we can play knight g4. Yes, bishop g1 is forced because the bishop yeah. needs to stay on the diagonal to protect the knight on d4. And after bishop uh, g1. And after bishop g1. All right, can we take on c3, queen takes c3, and then queen d5? Then I can play knight f3, and I think I'm still more or less... Better, yeah, that's, that's nice, but it doesn't work, okay. But let's ask yourself a different question. Yeah. After bishop g1, okay. what yeah. is the dependency on that bishop on g1? The knight on d4 is it's being defended by it. Yes. So what does that mean for the bishop on g1 in terms of protecting something else? H2. H2 is not protected by the bishop anymore. Right? Once we take on once uh, once we take on d4, yes. Yes, so that means that after knight takes h2, bishop takes h2, queen takes d4, would just win a pawn. Okay. That means and after knight takes white, h2, and white cannot play, white cannot take with a king because there is this. Uh, yeah, I see that. Okay. There is a hidden mate on g4, and how would you exploit that in case of king takes h2? I will take on b4 to open the diagonal for the queen and threaten the knight on c3. Yes. So you see that even d5 will not lose any pawns by pushing d4. So after d5, e5, the push on d4, this is a kind of standard mechanism, especially mm -hmm. when playing with a bishop pair. And such kind of mechanism you should never forget in your life, and you will not, okay. because... For us, when we look at this position, we already know the pattern of d5, e5, and e d4, and we automatically consider it because we know that these things may sometimes work. Yep, 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 okay. So once again, for everybody, e takes f6, bishop takes f6 makes no sense. We get back our piece and end up with a much better position. Yeah. If bishop takes d4, then bishop takes f3 is the best solution. If you capture on f3, we capture on d4, and then we also attack the knight. If you capture on f6, then simply bishop takes f6, and you end up with some pawn advantage after rook takes c3. Yeah. For this reason, after d4, knight takes d4, was forced knight g4 happened in the game, the bishop is still depending on protecting d4, and then you see some kind of pattern connected to h2, so knight takes h2 here in the game, perfectly worked. Yeah. So after knight takes h2 in the game, rook h uh, rook fc1 was played. 
What would you play here, Nicola? Okay. All right, so this became quite messy. All right, so we are actually not down any material, right? No. No. So what is the move you would do in a blitz game here? What do you think? Uh, in a blitz game, I would just, uh, I cannot take on b4 because that's uh, that fails to queen b4 and the knight is defended and then knight, uh, so I can't do that, okay. Um, in chess, we say the strat is stronger than the execution. Yeah. Bishop takes b4 is the execution. Yes, and so what are my options? I have that beautiful knight. So I that if so I don't want it switches under the threat. It can not be taken, but if I play knight g4, then bishop b4 is actually is a threat. Yes, and knight g4 actually is this the threat yeah. is the best move. It's easy. And the funny part is you cannot yeah. prevent the threat because you cannot do anything against queen h4. If you go something like knight f3, the problem is also that you are like losing by capturing on d3, for instance, followed yeah. by queen g6. Yeah, so that's yeah. why... I, I need yeah. to even if you play queen d3 and take on f3 and that's mate. Yeah, I mean, like you have... Yes, this is in addition to that. This I even didn't see, but yeah, yeah that fine. didn't work too. So after um, knight g4, knight e4 was played, bishop takes b4 happened in the game, knight g5, and here after queen d5, um, black just transposed into some endgame, exchanging the queen, not allowing any tactical tricks on e6. So that's why um, he played queen d5 and later won the game. For us, not interesting anymore. Here, the interesting part about this game is not to ever forget the pattern of d5, yeah. e5, and d4. Yeah. That is an automatic pattern for players of um, a lot of experience because that has this kind of pattern is seen a lot in Sicilian lines. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see that. Okay. Okay, now the next game. Okay. Different direction again. Yeah, and it's just, it's very good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I copy the fan and we go to chess.com. And now you are but winning again and you are black here. Oh, the previous game was a bot winning game. Okay. Uh, yes. No, the previous game, I'm not sure this was a Botwinic game, but I think we had Botwinic games beforehand oh, yes. in the last okay. lesson. That's oh, fine. <laughs> I got you. Okay, very good. Okay. Hey, Akhagdin, thank you for the follow. Thank you. And to Gary, and thank you for following. Very, It's very good to see you guys here. All right, so... So my automatism here tells me to play bishop g4, and I'm quite sure that that's not the right move. Very so, good, Nicola. Yeah, <laughs> so we already know that your automatism doesn't work yeah, <laughs> in these kind of positions. Yeah, meds 315. Yeah, three, that's that's exactly the thing. So what is my non-automatism that's telling me here? Um, material is equal. Mm -hmm. uh, Black King is at some point going to castle somewhere and going to become safer, though that bishop on, on C2 is a little bit dangerous, but I don't see any follow-up, at least not immediately. So we have a perishable advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, yes, it's Macabuano Botvinik. Okay, that's somewhat useful. Uh, so, uh, hey, J928, thank you for gifting 10 subs. That's very great to appreciate it, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Very, very nice. Means a lot. All right. So this is the type of position where I get myself into trouble. Uh, Actually, like, <laughs> let's try to get into the solution from the very logical point. What do you think here are your strongest pieces? What do you think are white strongest pieces? What do you think is one of the most important issues here in yeah. white's position or like some important squares because you can always memorize if you control a central square which means e4 d4 d5 e5 then if you get the entire control of that square the game almost is over because these squares would dominate you a lifetime that's just a general rule which always helps all right so we have this queen on h3 which is rather menacing but uh, i think the dominant feature of the position is this white square complex around the white king uh -huh. which basically means that this bishop on c8 is a very strong piece its counterpart is a little bit sidelined uh, meaning it's focused on attacking uh, something but it's not really it's not really defending anything so that's one I, f I would consider that to be the strongest piece in Black's position. The bishop on c2? Yes, yeah. it is. Uh, in white's position, yeah, it's bishop on c2. In black's position, well, this knight on c5 is nice, but it's a little bit dominated by that uh, bishop on c2, and I like the bishop on c8, surprisingly enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. But what do you think is the weakest piece in white's position? Is the bishop on c1, well, rook on a1 is the weakest piece. Yeah, okay, the rooks anyway here are we're, all weak. We're excluding them, so bishop on d2 is not doing anything. The bishop on c1, c1. c1. So yes. C1. Sorry. So let's imagine you are a magician and you take two minor pieces of white away and two minor pieces of black away which minor piece for black you would keep and which minor piece you wish white to keep so that you have the absolute domination in your opinion. Okay, so I would keep a bishop on c8 and I would take away the bishop on c2. I mean, all I mean, you have to take two minor pieces of both sides. You only okay. have the choice of keeping one minor piece in all the right. game. Uh, okay, I'm keeping bishop on c8, and I would like white to keep the bishop on c1. Okay, so you want to go with different colored bishops. You know that after these exchanges, like, you are, like... Um, in control of one of the central squares on e4, right? Yes. So what do you think? Which of the pieces would cause more damage landing on e4, the knight or the bishop? The knight. Uh-huh, and why then do you want to keep the bishop on c8? Okay, so I understand the plan. All right, very good. Uh, I. I understand what you're saying. So basically what we want to do is keep the knight and the bishop on c1. And yes, and you actually, will see. Yeah, and, yeah, and the plan is then fairly straightforward. We are exchange, we're taking the bishop on c3 and then we're playing bishop f5. And you will see that basically yeah. black is absolutely winning or let's say white will be hopeless. This is giving absolutely, actually like after bishop f5, Objectively here, yeah. white can resign. White will not have a chance against any player with uh, 23, 24, unless something really strange is happening. Yeah, no, this is, this is a totally dominant knight and completely useless bishop. Okay. Yes, now in the game, g4 was played. And the reason is if g4 is not played, h5 will be pushed. And then also this way, um, black will secure the dominance on the white squares on the king side. 
So he went for g4, queen e6, and bishop a3. The bishop appears to be like um, active, but this diagonal is just very much useless because he cannot cause any damage to us as the king can still, if the king pass wants, the queen side, yeah. pass the queen side. So after king f3, what do you think? What here could be a good move? Uh, for, um, for for black for black yes okay we're not I don't think it makes sense to go pawn grabbing here so taking on c3 is not appealing I would probably uh, I mean one option is to play h5 very good this is your intuition option and this is the strongest one by far yeah okay so, I mean, also like knight takes c3, by the way, would be actually a crucial mistake because now, I mean, also b7 is uh, hanging. You have to go something like knight b5 and you would go away from your favorite square. Yeah, no, uh, to be honest with you, I I wasn't even calculating that because I, I wasn't playing it. So it's h5. So h5 here was played. It's very logical because, okay, this way I automatically like um, develop my rook you are not uh, entitled to go g5 or taking because of queen h3 and yeah. queen g2 with a mate, or at least you win the queen after knight f2 yeah, check. Yeah, I see that, yeah. Yes, so h3 was forced, and this was not enough for Bodwinnik to penetrate on the king's side. What do you think? What did he do here? Hmm. Good question. All right, so we kind of don't want to. I mean, we can castle and then double up the rooks and so on, but that appear that slow this. That. I mean, long castle would still be a huge advantage for black. This is actually without any doubt, but he decided to put more pressure on white's king. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So what we can do here is if we take and we take and then um, I mean if you capture on g4 you release pressure this you only do if you have something concrete and if there's no concrete winning after taking, yeah, taking on h1 then you don't do that because yeah. there's no need to increase this decrease the pressure all right so to increase pressure we can play something along the lines of uh, all right, let me think for a second. What's the best way to do this? We can play g5. g5 is an option, but like what actually by logical means, which of white's pawns is taking space from you? It's the pawn on e5, so we can uh -huh. push f6. Yes, f6 was pushed, and the idea is very simple. I attack here, and if you capture, I open up the g-file, which means yeah, that after yeah. long castle and rook g8, you will not be able to withstand that pressure yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So f6 was played in the game. Now c4 was tried by white. And here actually, in my opinion, um, black did not that well by capturing here because it actually like uh, releases pressure long castle was enough to win yeah. immediately he took and here he also took on um h1 because he saw that after knight d2 check and knight c4 sorry he would win that pawn but he actually long castle is stronger because now i have plenty of attacks anyway he won the game for us not so much interesting anymore just this example basically shows the power of the right yeah. exchange because with a knight on e4 which you are not able to take away even not with a rook because sometimes these sacrifices would be better than to allow that that means you have no counterplay at all and you basically have a lost case okay Good. okay Next example, let's see. Yeah, that's a funny one. One second. 
I have to close um, the other ones. Okay, and one second. Oh. And I copy the pen. And you will be black. Okay. If you know it, you tell me and I change because it could happen that I showed it on one of the streams earlier. No, I don't recognize it. Okay, then it's black to move. Okay. All right, so... All right, so let me think for a second. Uh, there is exactly one check, which is actually interesting. There is a... Uh, all right. Uh, there, there is exactly one meaningful capture, which is that connected to that check. So, and the pattern that is a Appealing is if we get rid of this bishop and then castle long, we are rook h2, rook a8, and we are are we mating? Yeah, we we may be mating, but we are not. We need this bishop to control g4. Okay. Very good. That's beautifully summarized. I wouldn't be able to do it in any better case. Now make this work. All right, so that's the mo those are the motives. So how do we do that? Um, we need to keep this bishop on this diagonal. All right, so how do we do that most effectively? All right, because we need to control g4. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so that's one option. That's probably the one move, and then c6. Will be the answer. Yeah, and then we have a problem. Hmm. So do we have, so let's assume. Okay. Well, we don't need to castle, we can play king f7. Right. So if you play king f7, I'm just going to uh, emulate Hikaru and draw some arrows. So we play king f7, and white takes. We play king h2, and we take on two, then we give a check here. King goes to h3, we give a check on h3, and then... All uh, right, so where is the mate in this position? We give a check on h3, king needs to go to g4. And there is no mate. And there is no mate. We don't have time to play king g6, so there is no mate. So, uh, so bishop uh, b7 appears not to be the right move. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... So what is our alternative? All right, we obviously cannot put it here on e6. We cannot put it on f uh, on f2. F5, yeah. F5, sorry, yeah. And we cannot put it on g4. Mm -hmm. And we can put it on h3, but that obstructs the play. Yeah. So what is basically your mistake here in your thinking process? Your mistake basically is that you bound to activate that rook only on one square, which is h8. Correct. How perishable is this? It's perishable because white play knight e2 or knight d3, which is actually better. And once this knight gets exchanged, the whole mating pattern is gone. 
Yeah, so if this knight gets exchanged, you should be sure that you win something for it. So we have to look for a move, obviously, not only with trying to activate our worst piece, which is the rook on a8, but also to do it with a threat and an effective way. Okay, that's fair. And the weakest piece is the rook on a8. And you are dreaming of the pattern of rook takes h2 and rook h8. Yeah, no, 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 understand. So basically, we need to leave the bishop on c8. All right. And we need to stop c6. So we can play c6 here. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, in case of d6, let's say. Then we play rook a7. Uh -huh. And we have activated the plan. Exactly. And what is the good part about c6? That after knight e2 or knight e3, you play what? Or what do you get? We, we are going to grab the two pawns. We're going to exchange the two pawns. And then we're also going to get this very nice diagonal here, which is killer. Very good. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so we, yeah, so that's the solution. Okay. Mm -hmm. So with C6 here, the, the difficulty about this exercise is, is that in your mindset, it's always connected with Bishop D7 long castle to activate that rook. Yeah. And you may forget that the rook has yeah, a different yeah, yeah. root. Yeah, actually, it's very funny. The, one of the reasons why I was ultimately able to see it is because that swinging of the rook is, I learned that by play martial attack. Mm -hmm. That's one of the motives there, anyway. It's not yes. important. Okay. Okay. Another uh, one. Okay. Uh, here we go. Let me just see if I can know. I have to close the other windows. And uh, here we go. Let's say, and we go into some totally different aspect. We go into end games. Ah, I was I was about to ask how come you know Masha is getting all these uh, nice end games that I know and I'm getting these. Uh... Let's see how much you know them. You're white here. All right. Uh, did did I show this to Masha? No. I didn't see it even if you did. All right. So this is a. No, I don't think I showed that one to Masha. Okay. All right. So this is this is a. Uh pawn breakthrough probably yes because otherwise right. so uh, you have to resign i don't know if we can resign when playing f4 and then whatever you play i'm doing g5 f6 and i'm pushing this pawn and this is my automatism saying so let me double check what i'm doing uh all right so i have i'm white so i have to play f4 right otherwise i'm gonna be in trouble it's interesting because after a four, you can resign the game. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Okay, very good. So, uh, so let's forget about the optimism and let's think. Yeah. Think also like basically there's okay. always a kind of logic in, in, in pawn breakthroughs. Okay. What do you think? The first thing is always like one rule says ah. pawn breakthrough should always be in the middle and not on the side. That is usually the way of success yeah, all right, which yeah, means right. yeah no I, I hear you I, I need to play g5 first wait 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 that is, I, this basically that means that a move like g5 should be obviously considered yes. but here comes the part every pawn structure has a source like like yeah. a plant yeah. has a source to grow and what is the source of black's pawn structure here what is the guy in Black's pawn structure from those three who is responsible for the stability of that source. G7? Yes, G7, because you know that G7 is this guy who is responsible to basically leave the option of getting to H8. So yeah. we 
if you try to attack the source of G7, you will make it. What is the problem then with G5 or with the move of F4? Uh, okay. Because black is... Hold on. The problem with G5 is that... Hmm. That my threat is to push f6. Yes. That's, so that's, to, that's attack, yeah. mm -hmm. to attack the source. But what is Black's reaction? How does Black basically save the stability? He plays f6. He plays f6 and you can resign because of the rule outside passes are usually the one deciding the game. Yeah. Game over immediately. Okay. So what, from the logical point of view, should be the move here to be considered when we speak about attacking the source? So, all right. Well, I'm here being penalized for talking about sweet end game positions. So, you know, all right, for flexing. I shouldn't have, all right, so, Basically, the move is f6. Mm -hmm. Because with f6, basically, like here, we destroy the pawn structure. And suddenly, h6 is vulnerable because it is the last man standing. Yeah. And then you play f4. Now five. you do the calculation. How is the position after f4? Who is winning? Or is this a draw? Or how will the game end? Okay, if I'm not mistaken, black needs to play like something along the lines of king d5. Mm -hmm. And then I play g5. Yes. And uh, all right. And the, bl the black can actually play king e6, but I'm going to take on h6 and if black plays king f5 then i'm just gonna can push all right yeah i'm white is winning so give me the variation okay so king so d5 king d5 g5, g5 yes uh, best move is to try to get into the square of the h pawn. Yes, so we speak about this king magic. E6. Well, yes. I mean, like after king e6, I mean, like in order to hold h8, I need to enter one of those three yeah. guys, which means after g5, what is the automatic first move which makes sense for black? Uh, it's basically to take. We can, we will take the pawn, take the f pawn to clear yes, the course. clear the path for the king. Yes. So f takes g five. F takes g five. Yes. Then okay. next move. Uh, the next move is uh, king e six. Yes. So white has and to then play. I pl then I take on h six. Mm -hmm. uh, black plays king f six, and then I play king c two, and black king has to get out of the square because of our magic guy on h5 yeah. holding the square on yeah the sheet. exactly and the chess it's winning with the sort fine because yeah uh do you mind if we show this to the yes to the audience course. you can show it all right so this 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 and king c2 and the king is he needs to get out and the king needs to move and when he moves he cannot hey just on earth thank you for gifting uh five community subs uh, five tier one subs that's very greatly appreciated okay all right so um lesson learned don't do automatism Yes, automatism is a very bad enemy, and this is unfortunately the enemy which is connected to yourself. Well, those are the worst usually, right?
I mean, this is actually like one of the biggest problems, I think, I mean, one of the biggest differences, in my opinion, between like, uh, let's say, experienced players, like international players, grandmasters, and less experienced players is like that they know that sometimes the automatism is misleading and they would still double check it. Yeah. And they would go further and they would not break it saying like, oh, I get a double pawn and I don't go further. Okay. This is one issue, of course. Then, of course, it could be also some other things like, uh, like the obvious is not always obvious. These kind of um, uh, traits, which are sometimes supplying. And of course, to know the selection of candidate moves would be wider by automatic means. But in general, like it's all a kind of pattern recognition because even middle games have a lot of patterns. The oh, winning game where you exchange the pieces is also a pattern recognition because we know yeah. the knight on d4 is the game changer. Yeah. Uh, oh, chess on earth, thank you for gifting more subs. Another another batch of five. That's very good. Three. Very greatly appreciated. Thank you, my friend. Let's give uh, chess on uh, chess on earth is a streamer and. A, big supporter of this channel please please give chess on earth a follow and he's a great guy and he streams only chess and he has very educational streams so thank you thank you chess on earth okay very greatly okay appreciate nicola it. yes you want a last one about pawn endings to prove your knowledge oh god all right i'm being set up guys yeah let's do it it's fine yeah, yeah one so, second let me just yeah. find something um uh, illustrative i opened my big mouth now i'm in trouble <laughs> i mean like we will have it in uh, there are like uh, two two examples building up from each other so okay. first you get the theory and then you will get the practice okay very good okay. thank you okay Stop. black to move is it draw or is it winning for white hmm. okay uh black to move mm -hmm. this is uh this is basically similar to the study you actually showed on your on one of your seminars with the difference that the um h pawn was not connected it was anna um, anna who was showing this example yeah, yeah, yeah. It was more in the center okay so the idea here if i'm not mistaken is that black king goes to be gets to be eight and at which point black can resign right but i mean the question here is if black goes to c7 all right, mm -hmm. let's play here. C7, A6, C6. Um, okay, A6, C, um, C7, A7, King C7, and then we are, we have a little bit of a pickle here. Hold on, let me think for a second. Um, hmm. all right so black moves right yes so black needs to play a7 or c7 mm -hmm. that's the first question king a7 or king c7 yeah okay i mean this is the easy one the sure. practical example will follow up all right, just to give you the picture first all right very good so king c7 king a6 king c6 Okay, king a7. And this doesn't work. What am I missing? Uh, yeah, because I cannot go to whatever is to the left of a. I don't have that option. <coughs> Therefore, I can't end on b8. <coughs> So that limits uh, white king's options. So king c7 is the better move. Okay, king a7 actually loses on the spot. Why does king a7 loses on the spot? It was uh, already mentioned by chat, actually. 
Yeah, we have, uh, there is a5. Mm -hmm. And you lose your opposition and the king yeah. is in front of the pawn, so this is lost. So king c7, king a6, king c6 you mentioned, king a7, king c7. What yeah. about king a8 here? Uh, king a8 is, can we go to c8? It's not like we can, we have to, because after king c6 we are losing, why? Because when the king, um, <clears throat> actually I don't see it, sorry. So, I mean, once again, king c7, king a6, king c6, king okay. a7. Okay. King yeah. c7, king mm. a8. You said king c8, which is absolutely right, and the yeah. game is drawn. But yeah. what about king c6? Why does it lose? Okay. Oh, yeah, king b8. King b8, and you sneak from behind, you yeah. capture that pawn, yeah. and you win the game. Yeah. Very good. This was now the easy part. And now okay. we will build up this. I mean, I wanted you to see the picture of no, it. No, there were, the, what confused me, there were like uh, two king c6s. So I didn't know which one you had in uh, mind. One that uh, king a6, king c6. So I didn't yeah. see that. Okay. So that was just the building <clears throat> up yeah. for the practical example, which is to come now. So, black to move here. You have to hold this game. And you will need the knowledge of the previous example at some point. Okay. White to move and wins. No, black to move. Oh, black to move. If white was to move, white will easily win after a3, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. Basically, <clears throat> it would just uh, play a3, king b3, king b4, and it's... Uh... King takes b5, and uh, we would have plenty of spare tempi to go for. Yeah, 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 yeah. all right. Mm-hmm. All right, so let me think about it. This is actually an interesting position. And I'm going to flip so I'm black. Okay. So I basically cannot... Hey, Del3, YC, thank you for the follow. Thank you also, Evil Viz, for the, for the follow. That's very greatly appreciated. Thank you. All right, so so basically, King A five is immediate loss. It's that it's what appears to be because King B three, it and then we need to go back and we're in trouble. So so yes. So we have only one move, which is B four. Yes. So after B four, what is the only one response of your opponent? Which is C four. Absolutely correct, yes. Then after c4, what moves do we have and which we can exclude on the spot? Okay. So this is almost a fourth sequence because so the sequence that does so b4, c4, king a5, king b3 and uh we are in trouble right yes because you will not be able to push b5 because of c5 yeah. and if you play king a6 king yeah. takes b4 we get the same pattern like in the previous example just yeah. with millions of spare 10 yeah so b4 c4 b5 will be answered by c5 and we have the same issue and then we are we're still in trouble uh-huh. And we're still lost. Do we mm -hmm. have any other resource? Well, you have only one option left, which you didn't check after B4, C4. Um, we played King A5, right? Yes, we played King A5 and we played B5. And we understood both of these moves are not helping. Do we have a stalemate somewhere? I'm afraid no. No. So, so 
we can play king b4, but that uh, pushes oh, the, the, pawn is, the pawn is on b4. Yeah. So after b4, c4, if king a5 and b5 both is easily losing, what is the last option to check? Do we have another option? We have, well, we can, have play B, we can play b3. Uh -huh. We can play b3. What do we know about pawn endings? We know that we are making a draw against a pawn down when the king is not in front of the pawn, but behind that pawn, which means after b3, a takes b3, king b4, followed up by b5, we know it's a draw. Yeah, okay. By rule. That means after b3, what is white's best answer? a3. A3, yes. And now we have to understand what to do after A3. What are the options after A3? Okay. Uh, well, we need to relinquish. We, we need to play King A5, right? Yes, because B5 is once again answered by C5. Five, and and yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then we are basically back to the position. We are basically doing the same position we just we have just shown. Yes, but there is a difference. The difference is like we already provoked a three. So the only spare tempi which she has left in mm -hmm. our position of the previous example is a four. And this one we have to take from him. So let's do the calculation. After b three, a three, king a five, king takes b three, king a six, forced. Yeah. right king b4 mm -hmm. and this is a moment when we have to be careful where to go with our king okay so we need we are we need to go back to we want to answer king b4 with king b6 we want to answer king b5 with king b7 yeah i'm right? sorry king b5 with king b7 so so we need to go to king a7 Yes, and that is basically the solution of that puzzle. Wow. And this okay. actually, for this solution, it is quite useful to know that the previous example, which we had as a basic example, is draw. Because yeah. we had exactly, basically, this position with a pawn on a4, king on b5, and king on b7. And all we need to know is to start with king a7, king b5, king b7, yeah. and we are back on track. Wow. Okay. That's why these kind of basic pawn endings are really helpful. All these rules, also the rule, for example, like for us, we mm -hmm. already know that here, this is a moment where I would stop my calculation because I know B5, I exchange and it's a draw and I don't even calculate any further. Yeah, because it's yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The same is like that. I know that this position is a draw. So all I need to do is to work out that here I steal the last reserve temple. Yeah, and that, yeah. Wow, cool. And that you need to play king c7 in this position. Yes, okay, but king c7 actually here, this is actually easy to, to, to understand because you can easily spot that here you're losing because you lost the opposition yeah. and the king is in front of the pawn. Yeah, and uh, and that cannot be re cannot be reversed because the a4 pawn is a draw. Okay. Because we will cut sure. him now yeah, on yeah, the yeah. vertical line. Sure. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, Nicola. I hope Thank you. <clears throat> you enjoyed. <clears throat> I certainly and... did. Thank you. That was that was actually really great. Um, the takeaway is. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, sorry, guys. Get to the. I'm out of water. Um, figure out the way to eliminate your opponent's uh, best piece for preferably a piece of yours that's not so good, and be make sure that your automatism doesn't let you down. Yeah, that is basically the two big uh, yeah. things which happens. Like the automatism is a problem which will follow you. The entire life same for us not right. only for for like um, less experienced players like we also like are trapped by our own automatism in a lot of cases yeah no absolutely true all right guys um so 
anyway i am looking forward to our next lesson lizzie that's very greatly appreciated i am gonna send one to send the stream to another student of yours, Maria Yemelianova. Yeah, she's online, right? She's online, so that's a perfect, uh, perfect uh, raid. Say hello to Maria for me. She's a great lady and a great supporter of this channel and a great streamer. And also, she is doing lessons with Lizzie on Tuesdays. I think it's yes, the same usually. time. Yes, okay. same time. Thank you guys. I am sending the raid over and thank you so much. I will see you tomorrow at 6 a.m. And then we have the Open Film Media Arena on Saturdays. I don't have yet the opponent for my Sunday match, but we'll go from there. Thank you guys.